Hi, everyone. Um, it's really great to be here in Seoul. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I would have to thank Seiju for convincing me to come. I don't often travel internationally for work. I've been trying to maintain a more balanced schedule. So um, this was really an honor. And Seiju explained to me the caliber of the people that were here. And I'm just really excited to connect with you all today. Um, so I'm going to give a short presentation about the work that I've done at Rock Health. And then Seiju and I are going to have um, a dialogue around some of the themes and trends that we're seeing in digital health. So let's start with my story. In 2010, I was working at Apple headquarters. Um, I was actually a Harvard Business School student. And I had the opportunity to cover the healthcare and medical segment of the App Store. And the story I tell is that I was sitting next to the woman who was covering the ga gaming category. And she was working with all of the very creative developers that were building apps in the gaming segment. And um, I was covering the healthcare segment, which was much less colorful, much less exciting at the time. And I recognized that there was a need for some of these really great entrepreneurs and developers to be working on applications in healthcare and medicine, and that we really needed their talent in this very important space. So I went back um, to finish my MBA, and I worked with um, a classmate of mine, Dr. Nate Gross, to start Rock Health. Um, the concept be rock, behind Rock Health is that we're a full service seed fund. We find promising entrepreneurs and we give them uh, funding and tailored support to help these companies succeed. We know that if we wanted to make a dent in the healthcare space, that we had to work with the healthcare system and not against it. So we positioned Rock Health at the center of innovation. First, we fund companies, we give them capital at the seed or series A stage generally an investment of a quarter million dollars. And currently, the limited partners that are in our fund include um, top tier investors like Kleiner Perkins, Investor Venture Partners, as well as hospitals in the US like the Mayo Clinic and Kaiser Permanente. We also provide our portfolio companies access to clin clinical expertise and key opinion leaders at the country's leading medical institutions. Harvard Medical School, Brigham and Women's, UCSF, and the VA, they all support our companies in the form of pilots and clinical expertise, validating the efficacy of their products and sometimes turning into customers. We also have deep partnerships with innovation groups at companies representing multiple aspects of the US healthcare system, because ultimately we know that distribution is just as critical as validation. And so we work with majors in every sector from Genentech and Biopharma, CVS and retail, Qualcomm and wireless, and Blue Shield, which is one of the largest payers in the US. Taken together, we believe that funding along with pilots, validation, and distribution can help companies get to scale faster than they would otherwise. But most importantly, we now have a network of the best digital health startups in the US, and the founders in our portfolio are able to support one another. There's some shots um, from our office space. Our headquarters are in San Francisco. And our portfolio companies come by for regular workshops and speaker series, and we're always bringing in customers for them to meet with and experts in the space. We have dozens of companies in our portfolio, and while I wish I had time to talk about all of them, I pulled out three that I thought were very interesting examples of digital health. The first example is Cellscope. Uh, Cellscope came to Rock Health out of a lab, a microscopy lab at Berkeley in 2011. They developed a hardware gadget that sits right over the camera of a smartphone and turns it into an otoscope. With their product, a parent can capture diagnostic quality ear images to detect ear infections at home. Ear infections are the most common reason parents bring their child to a doctor. And here's the thing, parents always know when their child has uh, an ear infection or not, but we still require them to drag their child to the clinic for the treatment. Now imagine the amount of time and money that is saved if parents can actually share that image or the video of the inner ear with their doctor and get it remotely, remotely diagnosed and get the prescription to their doorstep. Cellscope is FDA approved in the US and they're in thousands of homes in the US, especially in California. 
I was interested to learn that telemedicine is actually illegal here in Korea, um, which is unfortunate because one of the fastest growing companies in our portfolio is a telemedicine company called Doctor on Demand. They are tackling the age-old healthcare industry problem of skyrocketing costs and increasingly limited access to care. Founded just two years ago, they've already built a team of 1,400 credentialed physicians around the U.S., and over 1 million people have downloaded their app. In addition, they have over 200 employer customers, and to fuel this growth, they raised $50 million this year, bringing their total amount raised to $74 million. The third company I wanted to share is called Neurotrack. Neurotrack came to Rock Health in the summer of 2012 after completing a multi-year NIH-backed trial at the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center at Emory University. They ended up following these patients in the trial for an additional two years, and they found out that their software could predict Alzheimer's three to six years earlier than the status quo. Their diagnostic isn't a biomarker, it's not a genetic test, it's actually an eye-tracking test taken on the computer. It's, a, it's based on innate human preference for novelty, and with its algorithms can detect highly subtle changes in a person's cognitive function. Today we have no treatment for the millions and millions of people who suffer from this devastating disease. Many experts will tell you that we know the targets, that we have the molecules, but simply cannot get the drugs tested on the right people most likely to develop Alzheimer's before this irreversible disease has destroyed key memory centers. The current standard of diagnosis is simply too late. Neurotrack's product is one of the keys in finding those people that are most likely to develop the disease so that we can bring the right drug to market. So the potential for technology to transform healthcare is huge, and venture capital in the U.S. is following this opportunity. I guess you guys have already seen these slides since other people have used the Raquel slides. Um, but after unprecedented and significant growth in digital health funding last year, the pace this year has been slightly slower to start. Um, we're about 70 million short of 2014's first um, half record. Uh, but our growth on a trailing 12-month basis is up um, over 25% over time. And since we started tracking uh, venture funding in the space in 2011, we've grown, as you can see, from 1.1 billion in 2011 to 4.3 billion last year. As I mentioned, last year, 2014, was a landmark year for digital health. We have about six more weeks to find out how 2015 comes in. So this is what I think is most interesting. Um, growth in digital health in this space is, is outpacing venture funding in all other sectors. So we generally think of in Silicon Valley as software, the technology sector is um, very fast growing. Obviously healthcare, biotech and medical device sectors have been fast growing, but digital health has actually outpaced the growth of all of these sectors, which is quite significant. And then when you look at the trends that investors are investing in digital health, um, there are six categories that make up more than 50% of the deals. Um, so I'll name a couple of these. These are all in your handouts, so you can read more about them. But the first is wearables and biosensing. So you all know Fitbit. Hopefully you know Misfit Shine as well. Um, these are accessory devices um, that detect specific biometrics and are designed for consumers. The second category is big data. So we're seeing growing demand for data aggregation and analysis to support a wide range of healthcare uses from hospitals to researchers. The third category is healthcare consumer engagement. These are the consumer tools for the purchasing of healthcare products and services or health insurance. Uh, the fourth category is telemedicine, as I mentioned, doctor on demand, but telemedicine as a whole really includes any sort of delivery of healthcare services synchronously or asynchronously through non-physical means. So this includes telephone, digital imaging, and video. Uh, the fourth largest space that we're seeing is the employer wellness space. Sejo, I heard you know something about this space. Um, it includes digital tools and services purchased by employers and large companies to keep their employees healthy and productive. And then lastly, um, the least sexy of all the categories, electronic medical records uh, and clinical workflow. These companies help support the flow of clinical, um, the flow and storage of clinical and medical records. So now that we know what the investors are investing in, um, we can take a look at what investors like me expect to see back. 
So obviously we're pouring billions of dollars in the space with the intention of not just changing the healthcare system, but also making money. Um, in the first half of the year, we tracked 92 acquisitions. This is very exciting for exits for investors. This compared to 95 exits overall in 2014. So good news again for investors and founders alike. The most acquisitive firms are actually other digital health companies who are acquiring more than half of the companies that we tracked. Um, so in a more and more competitive environment, these guys are looking to grow talent, revenue, and product lines through acquisitions. And the most notable transition, transactions so far in 2015 include the Under Armour purchase of MyFitnessPal for $475 million and Managed Care Healthcare Associates purchasing pharmacy software company SoftWriters for $450 million. And of course, there is appetite on the public market as well. Venture-backed digital health companies with IPOs just in the first half of this year were able to raise more than a billion dollars on the public market and reach more than $10 billion in total market cap. The Fitbit IPO was by far the largest IPO of the year um, for all sectors, not just digital health, and it had an incredibly successful debut run by James Park, Korean American. Um, they will pass $409 million in revenue this year, and they tripled revenue in the third quarter, which is mostly driven by strong demand internationally, um, and they've built out markets here in Asia. So let's see. Publicly traded digital health companies um, on the public markets that are being traded. Um, so we have a digital health public, uh, public company index, which is comprised of 25 digital health companies, and they total $71 billion in aggregate value. Um, and what, we, what we've been tracking with them is how this is comparing to the broader S&P 500 public market. And it's slightly outperforming, which is great. Um, and in the first half of 2015, it was really assisted by what I just said about the Fitbit IPO, which has been well. So this has been one of the fastest growing business segments in the US, and because the demand for healthcare is inelastic, investors are excited for continued growth in the years to come. Um, over the past few years, I've had the great pleasure of getting to know one of the most impressive entrepreneurs in digital health, who's actually from Seoul, um, Seju, and he actually lives with me in New York, and um, he, as I said, convinced me to come here today. So we're gonna spend the rest of this time having um, a dialogue around digital health. Um, thank you so much, Haley, for a nice uh, uh, introduction about uh, Rock Health and also kind of words about me. But um, I think we should give some uh, applause, round of applause to uh, Haley Tucker first for a nice presentation of her uh, speech. Thank you. Thank you. So again, welcome, um, Heli, to Korea, uh, my motherland. It's very nice to see you here. Uh, Heli has been awake since 2 a.m. I think that's why she's quite tired, but I uh, hope you can hold for 30 minutes. So um, I met Heli Taco at her event. It's called Raquel CEO Summit. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, uh, three years ago that I met mm -hmm. at uh, San Francisco Raquel's um, the office. So. Raquel organized a CEO summit that all the CEOs at uh, healthcare, uh, digital healthcare companies, she invited all the CEOs and then it's a day session. It's quite intense from the early morning till the end of the day that uh, share about the opportunity of where is the market opportunities and um, different uh, sector of the digital healthcare, but she nicely organized and not only share the insight, but she helped um, other entrepreneurs to interact together. I think. Um, Raquel has the most benefit to all like, uh, partners and portfolio companies because they provide a rich network. And um, that, that's how I met Raquel, uh, the Heli Taco. So it's nice to uh, see you, you in Korea and yeah. I was able to uh, bring you over here to this event because there are a lot of great entrepreneurs. Yeah. Good. So we have, uh, this is a completely open session. Um, I have a lot of pressure that I need to make a very uh, smart questions. But let's start from like an Rock Health and investment. Uh, the philosophy about your company. Yeah. I think that most of the audience will um, are cur learn, curious to learn about your yeah. investment philosophy like that. Okay. Although you covered most of the thing in the presentation, let me have some questions. So easy yeah. to ask, but hard to maybe answer. What's the most promising and hot area in a digital healthcare lately? 
Um, that, I actually, mm -hmm. the, the first question is a little bit easier and I'm happy to share some of what mm -hmm. we look for in investments sure um, thing. and then talk about some of the Let's trends we're most excited about. Um, so I started investing as an angel investor uh, seven years ago. Mostly I was living in Silicon Valley and I had a couple of opportunities to invest in companies that were started by very smart friends of mine. Um, so I kind of accidentally became an investor uh, through that through those means. I never was formally trained as an investor and it's yet to be seen if I'm even a good investor. We'll, we'll see. Give me about 10 years. Um, so when I started investing in digital health, I knew that I didn't want to be a traditional venture capitalist, but I wanted to be able to support companies. And so the, the, um, the phase of a company's life cycle that I think I can add the most value and that Rock Health adds the most value is really in the early seed stage. Um, and when you're investing at the early seed stage, as you, as you know, when you're fundraising in the early seed stage, you're really selling a mission, a vision, and that you're the team to do it. And so the sort of questions that we ask the companies um, early on really revolve around um, de-risking some of the very basic premises of the company. Mm -hmm. So there's product risk, there's execution risk, and there's market risk. And that's really how we look at the companies. Mm -hmm. Now, um, as you know, when you go on to raise Series B, Series C, as you grow your company, then the investors are going to start looking at the details of, of the unit economics. They're going to look at how, um, how a company like that can scale. They're going to look into the details of the contracts. And to me, that's not as fun um, as really just betting on the person. So we say, the, the phrase we say um, is we're betting on the jockey, not the horse. I don't mm -hmm. know if that translates well. But, um, and it really comes down to the team and if they're able to execute. So I think that answers your first question. If you don't mind, if I want to yeah. go deeper about that answer. Yeah. So a lot of people actually recognize the company, the Rock Health, but uh, you mentioned like excellently you got into capital, uh, the, the profession right now, you have it, but how did you pick up the healthcare sector? Why did you, why, a lot of investors out yeah. there, a lot of venture capitalists as well in mm -hmm. San Francisco and Palo Alto, but they struggle to define who they are, right? It's ABC yeah. Capital Ventures, but you guys are very well known for uh, digital healthcare, and I think you should take the pride of, um, be proud of your company. How did you build it, and uh, why, why healthcare? Yeah, uh, well, it, it goes back to the opportunity that I recognized at Apple, um, which was that the apps that were being built in this segment were so much worse than other categories. Mm. And so I just saw, a huge untapped opportunity for technology to be better in healthcare. Um, this was, you know, five years ago when we started Rock Health, and even in the last five years, we've seen such a proliferation of really fantastic innovations coming to market that didn't exist five years ago. And so, I wanted to bring attention to a market that I thought needed some attention, um, and that had the sort of um, intrinsic rewards that you're doing something mm. good for the world and um, you know not that nothing against the gaming segment but um, I would argue that the difference that you're making at Noom is much more significant than the makers of Angry Birds or other sure. apps sure. um, so I think that would be the reason can I have yeah. some question yeah you don't have to answer that if you don't want to but does it matter to you for health being in a healthcare sector could you be just a fine other like the other fintech or the other area, but does yeah. it matter? Does I, it, yeah, what does it mean to you about being in healthcare sectors? Yeah, well, I mean, I invest um, through my angel fund. I invest in all sectors, mm -hmm. so I'm I'm an investor in some education companies, not any uh, act one fintech company. Mm -hmm. um, so my thesis, personally, um, through over fifty angel investments that I've made in the past seven years is Fantastic. really around supporting great founders working on problems that I think are meaningful. Um, but my day job is, is in healthcare and why I think um, healthcare is most pressing in, in the U.S. in particular. Every mm. country has its own issues, but in the U.S., um, the costs are really what's getting me. Mm. And the um, spiraling cost, it's 17% of our GDP, mm. continues to grow, mm -hmm. it's, you know, $3 trillion market, and a lot of it is because of waste and inefficiencies. I so um, I would say it's probably the most messed up of all the industries, and that thus there's mm. the biggest opportunity. Thank you for the answer. Very good. Let me go back to your first answer about um, the investment philosophy. So you mentioned yep. about two, in order to de-risk, as an uh, investor's perspective, you pay attention to the members. You said right, team members, yep. absolutely, market fit like that. But 
honestly, I, I think uh, audience, including myself, will feel like that's kind of a very high level answer. But yeah. do you have own, your, your own secret, like how you define like these members will go through all the struggles over the start of journey? How do you define this team can figure that out? Can you give some tips? Yeah. So there's um, a level of maturity that we look for. Mm -hmm. We certainly would prefer founders that have worked together in the past because there's mm -hmm. nothing like testing out a relationship than sure. being able to test out the relationship. So mm -hmm. if they've made it through one startup together or they were on the same team at Google um, and have been in the trenches together, that's certainly more appealing to me than two people who met online with oh. an idea. <laughs> Um, and For I sure. see a lot of that. I see a lot of people who say they, they met their co-founder at a networking event or online. And um, I think that that's a lot riskier of, mm. a, of a start to a relationship. Um, so, you know, we, there, there are ways you can tell the level of maturity and the, st the mental stability that, as you know, is required to, sure. to operate a company in a resource-constrained, competitive environment. Sure thing. So, I guess uh, you definitely you prefer to meet uh, serial entrepreneurs who comes with a good track record. Absolutely. And also, like, the relations has been built before the business start as yeah. among the co-founders, right? Yeah. And, and to me, that's actually more important than them having healthcare experience. So, oh, wow. Um, why, I, why is that? Don't you think healthcare is very uh, special, uh, the area okay. that you need to understand about what that is before you enter into? So, I think a level of naivete is actually very valuable in this space. I think there's something that happens to you after you're in healthcare for a while. It's happening to me where um, you become a little, you have uh, war, war scars, battle scars from Correct. what you've gone through because it's extremely complex and challenging to work in the healthcare industry. And it is a old guard mentality that is unwilling to change. And I imagine that that's global. That's not just in the US. Uh, same here. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I actually think there's something about founders that come from outside of healthcare that they bring two things. One, they bring some um, optimism that <laughs> will get beaten out of them, but well, they sure. at least have it up, up front. Uh -huh. And they also have lessons and skill sets from other industries that um, I hope they can apply in positive ways in healthcare. Um, so I actually have no problem investing in a company without any healthcare founders. Um, however, I would highly suggest that they hire a chief medical officer at some point when the time is right. Um, and that's certainly mm -hmm. one of the early hires that they'll make. They'll certainly need someone with, with healthcare expertise if they're building a B2B company mm. and they're building out a sales team. They will need someone with that network. But mm. in terms of the two to three founders, if they have a healthcare background, it's indifferent to me. Uh, I thought it's very uh, good insight that you mentioned about at, the, at some point, the digital healthcare company start to look um, hiring like a CMO, chip medical officer, yeah. or and it comes with a business experience as a sales guy. I think um, that's quite good insight because my uh, our company, Noom, we uh, we had a similar problem that uh, I, uh, my background is not in healthcare, but I started the healthcare because I want to say I was um, brave, naive. I was brave enough that I was I did not know how hard it could be in the healthcare sector. That's why I found the company, I mm -hmm. think. But as company has been growing, that we need more uh, professional understanding yes. about the industry, not just denying the industry because we have to be in that industry. So lately, we actually hired a CMO. So I think what, insight what employee good. was your first doctor employee, MD employee? Pardon me. What, like at which mm -hmm. hire did you finally say, okay, we f probably should hire an MD or a chief medical uh, officer? After I hired um, hundred people. Wow. So up to yeah. then, mostly product product people. Mostly product people and then uh, marketing product, customer support, very yeah. important. And then uh, business development. And then we figured, because business development, while we're doing business with our clients, such as like a payer providers and uh, employers, we needed to have more um, the, the rigid answers and the support in, in the product. So yeah. it's more than we need an advisor, you know? We could yeah. figure out with our advisors, but our advisors are advisors. So we, uh, we hired actually a CMO lately and it's been quite uh, good. I, I want to say great, yeah. Yeah, but I imagine all your, the product folks that you hired were not healthcare product people, they were tech. Yeah, absolutely. People. Actually, one, so um, 
Rock Rockhouse the CEO summit always at the end ending session is like you invite like a quite key like a uh, pro high profile people from venture capital field like Fino Costello you remember you mm -hmm. invite him and then yeah. Fino Costello mentioned that when he uh, invested in uh, what is it PayPal mm -hmm. he actually gave an example at your event said uh, PayPal purposely did not hire any like an out of the, the financial background people in the beginning because they wanted to have a true yeah. innovation from uh, the tech uh, engineers and product people. Yeah. So I think uh, that's quite a good answer to what you said. Um, again, you review a lot of new companies and out of your portfolio companies, probably you know which area is hot, to what people say, media people, investors, the M&A market. But would you like to share some of the high level ideas? What's going on in the uh, MA market and uh, what area is quite um, busy lately? You see a lot of similar uh, the pitch from the startups? Yeah. Well, I mean, I showed the data. Yeah, the so, five I mean, within you that, that, I, I think telemedicine is really the, 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 the biggest opportunity that we really have in the US right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if we were able to change some of the regulatory hurdles here, it would be the same here. I see. Yeah. Speaking of the Fitbit, since he had a huge success in IPO and are doing quite good since they went to a public yeah. market, what do you think about the Xiaomi? Because are you aware That's of Xiaomi? That's the twenty-nine dollar one. Correct. So yeah. we're on the same page now. So, what do you think about all like a uh, relatively cheaper, actually much cheaper, and affordable yeah. and provide pretty uh, similar, pretty similar uh, data that uh, staffs and on. Uh, biometric information from like all made from China. What do you think about Fitbit's challenge in the future? How would they um, continue to grow and well? Or in general, well device, what is, what's your opinion about that? Well, I'm an investor in Misfit, so. Sure thing, let's um, talk about, uh, Misfit is great, yeah. And they have a, I think it's $49 now um, mm -hmm. version, the, so, yes. yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm really excited to see the prices come down. I think that that's, um, a critical piece to having these sort of wearables go mainstream. So, very positive. Do you, do you mean, uh, part of means uh, you will welcome, let's say, if you review some startups, it's presenting like a, uh, the wearable yeah. devices to Rock Health, would you consider to invest? Or do you think um, the wearable device market already I, I see crowded? Yeah, I think from a so from an investor perspective, um, I think it's already pretty saturated. So you'd have oh, to wow. have a pretty unique new feature to get me excited. Um, but from a market perspective, I think that the sort of competition is very good for consumers. Oh, it's yeah. for sure. It's good for consumers. The price yeah. will go down for sure. How, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna, I would like to flip the question back to you guys. I know you guys are actually taking data from a lot of these devices. Absolutely. Um, how do you decide which devices uh, to take seriously versus which ones you're gonna write off because they're not gonna make it? I love your question. We actually had a lot of opportunity we could um, expand our, our, move our vertical to create our own, uh, the own brand of device and also could work with um, key uh, the device makers such as Fitbit or Xiaomi, uh, the, the Misfit, but we, um, we didn't make that decision. The reason why, because people don't stick with that, the device for a long time. Yeah. So I'm sorry that I'm, I don't answer your question directly, but we have a very different yeah. view about that. Yeah. So um, my answer is uh, we, we let our users decide what they like to use the device to collect their uh, biometric information, such as a walking step and uh, weight and the other information. And I think uh, Apple, I, uh, Apple Health Kit and uh, Google Fit, such as that platform level now, and Samsung S Health like that, the platform level, they are welcoming all the devices um, pour the data, biometric information, convert the data only into the operating system and erase the brand name, right? Yeah. Because it becoming commodity about your data. Yeah. So Noom, our company, less care about where the data came from. We care yeah. about the data, how we will utilize it. Yeah. So my actual next question, did I answer your question? Fantastic. Yeah. So my question mm -hmm. to you that, the quantify yourself, the yeah. quite hot keyword two years ago, but I, I, what's your opinion about it? Quantify yeah. yourself. So we actually just did a survey of over 4,000 Americans um, on their sentiment. That's quite a big survey, yeah. It was a big survey. It was a six-month sure. lift for us. So oh, wow. um, we published it maybe two weeks ago. It's available online for free, so I would encourage Rock everyone to, to dig good. into it. But our, we had the same questions. So um, what do Americans want from technology? Okay. Um, and we asked questions from, do you want to talk to your doctor? 
via telemedicine to do you want to track um, your health? And what we learned was that the majority of Americans actually are already tracking some part of their, their health okay. and their life. Um, the majority of it is just in their heads. So they're mm -hmm. tracking their weight, but they just remember it. Mm -hmm. um, and, or they're writing it down, but the um, people already inherently want information about themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not at the granular day-by-day -day level, mm -hmm. but they want um, to have key measurements that give them an idea of how they're doing. And so 7% um, of Americans have actually had a wearable. They either had or have a wearable. Correct. Which I think 7% is quite high. It's, it's higher quite high. than, Seven than I would imagine. 7% is quite high, yep. Um, I don't know if they still have them. I agree with you that the, the lifespan of a wearable, I think it's six months was the average. Uh, what I heard lately is uh, less than three months now. Less than days. three months now. Yeah. yeah. Well, now they're cheaper, so. I guess. It's become more like yeah. accessories, but yeah. please continue. Yeah. Um, so, so anyway, so I think people are already tracking different data points and what I see the quantified self movement moving towards is more data, more easily collected. Mm -hmm. um, and easily saved. And so I think it's uh, only a positive thing for healthcare consumers. And I, see. Um, I think there are a lot of tricky pieces between how that data can be used in a clinical way or a uh, meaningful way. For sure. And some, you know, Noom is, is certainly one of the great companies that's tackling that. Thank you. But Thank why, you. why wouldn't more data be a, a good thing? Sure thing. I, I completely agree with you that I think the opportunity that uh, for start device makers and like us, Noom, that interpreting that data, I think the more opportunity will arrive as industry will uh, welcome and receive and uh, interact uh, with that data that somehow you collect the data from device and then the data will be transferred to hopefully a provider and payer side. Yeah. I, I think we are in that era right now. Good. Yeah. Um, do you have any companies that are out of your portfolio you want to brag about that um, is so y you are um, you are thinking it's really awesome and fastest growing out of your portfolio company. That way we can, we can uh, get some taste about what's happening in digital healthcare. Either yours or I love or all outside. my children equally. Mm -hmm. But uh, the fastest growing, you, you, you've, been, you've been reviewing the company. I mean, uh, Doctor On Demand is our fastest growing Doctor company. Doctor On Demand, the tele yeah. telemedicine. Yeah. Very good. Why do you think uh, Doctor On Demand is so hot compared to the other? There are a lot of the telemedicine companies trying to adopt the smartphone. Uh, and the, yeah. Um, apps, but what, what, why do you think? They're, you they're think, great yeah. at user acquisition. Hmm. And that's been the, the problem, um, the traditional problem with telemedicine is having to go through your payer, go through your provider versus just going directly to your phone and talking to a physician. Do you know uh, who is, so user acquisition is that's the, their key strength, is that right? Is what? User acquisition, absolutely, yeah. Hmm. Is that, <clears throat> are they going after right uh, directly to patients or the caregiver? To the patient. Patients? Yeah. And the patients are willing to take the service? Yeah. Moms in middle America want to connect with the doctor quickly. They're busy and want to, they just have a question that they need to ask. Mm. They don't have to go in and see a physician to ask the question. That's good. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. We talk about the quantify yourself and uh, device well, device well. Let's talk about Apple uh, Health Kit and the Google Fit the platform a little bit. Um, um, what do you think about their platform, the OS-wise, and uh, Qualcomm has Tunet, and Samsung has yeah. Health platform, but what do you think about the general ideas and the, your feeling, how are they doing, platform-wise, the big company yeah. platforms? Do you see that new platform is actually helping all the digital healthcare companies, or are they trying, but in reality it's not that yet? What, yeah. What's your general feeling? I, I think it's too early to tell. I'll say that. Mm. Um, Apple has generally not been great at software, so mm -hmm. I think Research Kit is going to be an interesting project to watch unfold because uh -huh. they're not, they haven't traditionally, they, they're great at hardware. The sure. Apple Watch is really interesting. Um, the sort of biometrics that we're starting to see in the Apple Watch is really interesting, but from a software and social perspective, um, there's not a lot of precedent for Apple to win sure. there. Mm -hmm. And then on the flip side, um, Google has, um, you know, traditionally been a software company. They, mm -hmm. they don't have a lot of um, traction in, in hardware products, but 
Um, they certainly started something with um, Google Glass, and we mm -hmm. have a company that's using Google Glass mm -hmm. in the in the doctor's office that's mm -hmm. doing quite well, called Augmetics. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, they've they have uh, Google's Google's efforts in health is. Uh, very layered. They're doing quite a bit. So a third of the investments out of Google Ventures is in mm -hmm. healthcare companies, which is pretty interesting. Oh, wow. They mm -hmm. acquired one of our companies called Lyft Labs. Mm -hmm. um, Google Life Sciences did. Um, they have their baseline project, mm -hmm. which is to get, as, it's a, basically a quantified self project. They mm -hmm. want to get um, as many data points from as many people as possible. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I actually love Google's approach right now. It's um, they're, they're taking a lot of risks and they're doing a lot of things and probably half of them won't work out. Mm -hmm. um, but I think their approach is um, very Google-like. They're, you know, moonshots, which is always really nice to see. I, I don't think either of Google or Apple um, uh, is going to build the kind of holy grail platform that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, a conversation that we have a lot everywhere, I'm sure uh, you guys have it here in Korea as well, is around interoperability mm -hmm. and a seamless way to connect all of our devices and all of our health apps. And I, I don't see either Apple or Google winning that battle, but I think they're going to both make a big impact either way. Good to hear because we make the apps, so I want to hear your opinions. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let's talk about investment a bit. We don't have that much time left. So I'm sure you get a lot of questions like from uh, outside of uh, America, but uh, Rock Health, would you invest internationally or mm -hmm. would you open your um, the branches at outside of the United States? Yeah. You know the answer, but um, I'll explain. So we are, we are completely focused on U.S.-based companies focused on the U.S. healthcare market. And it's actually part of our mandate in our fund is that we can only invest in, in U.S. companies. And the, the reason is twofold. One is that um, every, every country has their own unique issues, their own um, network of industry players. And we would be of little help to any company outside the U.S. that um, you know, was operating and focused on a different country. Now, that being said, we've invested in a lot of international entrepreneurs that want to break into the U.S. healthcare market mm -hmm. um, and that live in the U.S. and are building U.S.-based companies. Mm -hmm. But if a company comes to us that um, is, say, in the U.K., they have a completely different system than we do in the U.S., so we mm -hmm. really wouldn't be much help there. Um, so that would, that's kind of my, my short answer. The second answer would be that I'm, you would be better, someone in that market with that network would be a better investor than I could be mm -hmm. um, because they would have the sort of resources to support companies. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't want to kind of dilute the Rock Health brand and mm -hmm. um, the caliber of entrepreneurs we're able to work with because of our network. Mm -hmm. so, so that's a long way of saying no, we don't invest internationally, but mm -hmm. I always encourage investors in other countries to think seriously about the digital health opportunity because it is, as you guys saw in my slides, it is really one of the fastest growing segments in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and it's um, really pushing our stock market. It's creating a lot of um, you know, lucrative business opportunities. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, it's actually helping fix some of these problems that are bankrupting our country. So mm -hmm. I always um, am a big supporter of investors abroad that think that they, um, you know, think they might want to go into digital health. And my, mm -hmm. I'm always very optimistic and I, I think they should. But it really is something where mm -hmm. it's, it's a very local business. Um, thank you for the answer. Do you, do you see a lot of, um, uh, a lot of entrepreneurs are trying to uh, uh, be in your class to incubating program or get investment from Rockets out of the United States or usually most of the entrepreneurs who knock the door of your mm -hmm. uh, office is from United States, just ratio wise. Um, well, we have very clearly on our website that we only invest in U.S. Uh, for make a market, so. I'm saying international, like me, international entrepreneurs. Do you see a lot of inter international entrepreneurs are coming after you? 
Yeah, but I mean, they, I, I think we make it clear that we can't invest in them. So mm -hmm. we get we get a little bit of inbound internationally, but I would say we get more inbound from large corporates or investors mm -hmm. that are interested in bringing the rock health model to sure. their to their country. Uh, That's what we get a lot more of. Oh, okay. I think um, once they get established and start moving forward, Good. then I think the entrepreneurs will um, come out of the woodwork. I have two following questions. Yeah. Those, this might be difficult, but. Don't, don't, let's try. Okay. So knowing a like, Korean like uh, extremely like smart and high education and uh, working hard and going global is a quite key word for everywhere in South Korea. Yeah. Um, so for those like in a Korean uh, start young and passionate and talented entrepreneurs, what do they need to get into uh, digital healthcare market for American? Uh, you know, for America, what do you? What's the key uh, criteria you want to uh, uh, take a look and I want to give uh, some advice. So there are some they, people that here they, today. They wanna, uh, they wanna work in the U.S. healthcare market. For sure, like me. Yeah. Well, I would say do what you did, which is move to the U.S. Mm -hmm. and find a co-founder mm -hmm. um, that <laughs> has. Sorry, I don't want anybody to <laughs> get mad at me for saying move to the U.S. But mm -hmm. I, I think that the fact that you've been able to set up your company sure. in both Seoul and New York, and sure. you've been able to build um, a team, you know. It, internationally sure is, is certainly required so I, I didn't mean to have like a promo in my company but thank you <laughs> that was good. all right second follow up question is like, since healthcare digital healthcare sector is such, taking relatively longer time than the other startup area like, such as a game maybe or like a utility applications like that so it just takes so much time it's because I know it so because I run time. The time right so and time. clinical trials pilots like that yeah. so um, what's the best way to like an export that the, pro, uh, the process or shorten the time to get yeah. a real outcome? What's your general device? I think the the validation piece up front is really important. Sure. So uh, ensuring that the product is effective early on, so right. that you're not battling skepticism throughout your company's life cycle. I think a great example of that is Theranos, which you guys might have heard of. Um, there. Uh, a U.S.-based company that has been under a lot of scrutiny now because of their lack of transparency on if this, it's a blood test, it's a finger oh, yeah, blood it's a, it's test. Oh, it's a now, yeah. Yeah, cool. if it actually works. And um, I think that they would have had a different um, story the past couple weeks had they gone through peer-reviewed validation. I mean, you just have to kind of play the game sometimes. Sure thing. And the game is annoying. Healthcare is really challenging, and it doesn't make sense why... It's built the way it is, but mm -hmm. there's there are pieces of it where you really just have to play the game because at the end of the day, these are human lives that are at stake and you have to be careful and you have to not do any harm. And so I would say the way to go fast is to first go slow mm -hmm. and to first take the necessary steps to make sure that the product works and that it does no harm. Mm -hmm. And that'll also save you a lot of time because if you find out that it doesn't work, then you can move on to a new idea mm -hmm. um, versus finding that out later. So I think the valid getting validation done right the first time mm -hmm. early on, and then once you're confident and you have some sort of validation that it mm -hmm. works, um, then I think it's really all about having, if, if it's a B2B business, it's about having the right sales team and building um, the sales funnel and building new channels for mm -hmm. distribution. If it's a B2C company, then it's really about growth hacking. Mm -hmm. um, but validation first. I see. Thank you. Don't you think uh, enterprise or B2B companies like are, by nature, they kind of move fast, they cannot be agile in healthcare sector? Like in they pharmacy. cannot be agile. They cannot, they right? Cannot. They cannot. Yeah. But don't you think they are very like thirsty to get yeah. an in innovation from outside, such from like small companies. Yeah. So, do you, Rock Health, or you personally, accommodate the like the network, a networking event, or do you connect them to yeah. the startup people? That way, you can help the startup move faster. Yes. And make the real deal. Like that. Can yes. you share some ideas so, about it? So, I'll, I'll say Please. two things on that. One is yes, B two B goes slowly, but you really just have to go faster than your competitor. Mm -hmm. So it's okay if you're going slow as long as the other guy's going slower. For sure. Um, but something that we do that is really beneficial to our portfolio companies, and it's something that um, really anyone here in the room could probably coordinate to support soul-based companies. So we have these innovation showcases where we invite 100 
customers. So we'll pick a theme. So maybe it's a biopharma theme. And across our portfolio of 50 companies, we'll pick eight mm -hmm. companies that sell to pharma. And then we'll have them come to this event and we'll invite 100 um, executives from the pharma industry. And it's essentially a matchmaking day. Um, mm -hmm. And they are able to have you know, the, the right conversations with the right people at the right time. Mm -hmm. And that's been, I think, very helpful. Just opening those doors has been really helpful for our portfolio. So uh, we've done that mm -hmm. for hospital administrators, for health insurance companies, mm -hmm. for pharma. So anyone mm -hmm. that um, any of our B2B companies could sell to. And mm -hmm. you guys should definitely do that here as well. I, I am certain that they will benefit at both sides, the startup Absolutely. and also enterprise. So I'm Oh yeah, sure. they're always really excited. Yeah, Does they get to get out of their cubicles and come to? Well, you know for sure that the both end, like startup have no access to enterprise. Enterprise, they also don't know which one is good enough to spend yeah. time. So I think yeah. your job is very important. Yeah, having that sort of seal of approval. Like if the company is in the room, it's good. Sure thing. So. As a last minute, um, let's uh, take the, uh, this advantage. Since you are in, here in Korea, there are some uh, entrepreneurs from the audience. So if you don't mind, I want to ask if you are ready to pitch uh, to Heli Taco and They're we call pitch. yeah pitch elevator pitch <laughs> literally elevator pitch so uh, I'd like to uh, see someone is ready then give a one minute speech any brave enough that oh can yes can you can you stand up what what's your name and then present yourself come over please since we don't have much time, but let's, let's uh, uh, get going. So yeah, uh, please, John, what's your name and what do you do? Uh, I, am, yeah, you I am Min Hong from Lunit. Uh, we create artificial intelligence that can detect and characterize abnormalities in medical images such as chest x-ray, mammography, and even pathology imaging. Uh, our deep learning, cutting edge deep learning technology uh, help physicians to make accurate and objective medical diagnosis. We are working with uh, several major general hospitals in Seoul, and its scale is near uh, 10K beds and 12 million outpatients because it's very centralized in Seoul. And uh, our te technology is, uh, has strong record. One of, one of our projects is TB screening, tuberculosis screening on chest X-ray. It breaks the state-of-the-art record recently and is 96 percentage. The state of the art was 90, 90 percentage and is recently accepted by a conference. And we have uh, six Korean members, but uh, we have uh, one advisor from states and we, we was established, LUNIT established uh, in 2013 and we closed two million dollar funding recently, last week. Thank you. Congrats. Thank you very much. That was a Great. good and Congrats. long elevated pitch, but I like it. And congratulations for uh, that uh, funding. And um, are you targeting the American market? Is that right? Good. And if Heli, you were impressed, and I think uh, she will ask for your contact. <laughs> very good. Someone else? Don't know the brave one? Okay, sir. Hello. Oh. Oh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, my name is Ted from Zikto. Uh, we create wearable band, wrist type wearable band. Uh, we, do, uh, we analyze humans' walking posture in real time. Uh, we do rest of the uh, functionality with Fitbit or Job and Misfitter has. We do all the things and we all, on top of that, we actually analyze people's arm swing when, when they're walking. So we analyze their movement and then we detect if they're hunching their back or they're watching cell phone or if they're dragging their feet we detect various, various um, behavior on their walking as well. So what we actually do is um, we, our band, what we call Zikta Walk, is on the market right now. We, we uh, successfully have raised uh, over 165K from the Kickstarter. Now we shipped out most of the, our units and it's in the market now. But what we're, we're really focusing on is in the insurance market. We, had, we saw a really huge potential with the insurance market with the wearable market. So what we, actually, we are actually working with one of the largest uh, insurance company in Korea when we'll be launching the uh, insurance product next, early next year. And we're actually actively seeking for funds from the overseas, so if you're interested, please let me know. Great. Any, thank any, you. any, thank you very much. Any quick comment for two gentlemen? Yeah, no, those were great pitches. Did you, did you plant them here? Um, <laughs> how was my acting, good. 
Um, sir, do, do, do you have a, do you have a, the, the band? Do you have a, okay, do you have a sample? Is that, is that for Hallie? Come over, <laughs> run. I think the best way is that you just try it and then you see yeah. how it goes. Um, any uh, final comment for this session? So I think this is uh, all we have. Yeah, no, I mean, this, is, this has been great. Thank you for having me. Um, Quickly, yes. <laughs> Rockhealth.com. Oh, cool. Thank you. Thank you. That's beautiful. All right, last comment, please, Heli, for Korean entrepreneurs and uh, digital healthcare media uh, from enterprise and all the experts and professors. Comments? Um, so I'll, I'll leave it with one of my favorite quotes, Albert Einstein. He said that we cannot solve today's problems with the same level of thinking we use when we created them. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think it's really important that we have nice. founders from technology coming together with designers and healthcare people to all work together to make change. Fantastic. So, I'm very honored you. to have you today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Come <laughs> up.